lets us in, which we would really need to take that moment to um, to recognize and and actually see and, and, and learn from. So with Surat al-Araf, there were a number of different issues that we had talked about. Um, we talked about ittabi'u ma unzila. We started with alif lam mim sad and ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum mir kitabun unzila ilayka fala yakum fi sadrika haraj. We talked about that last time and we talked about how with alif lam mim, the, the different huruf al-muqatta'a the different huruf that come in those separated words, uh, separated letters, although we don't see it separated. And we talked about that earlier. Uh, the reason why we don't see it separated and, you know, we don't see alif um, separate from the lam, from separate from the meme, separate from the sub. We talked about that and, and we said that that's actually um, because the Quran in itself you can't necessarily just study the Qur'an and say, well, I know my letters, I can just move on. The Qur'an is tawqifi, and the Qur'an was, was recited by Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet alayhi, to the Prophet sallam, and to us. And the only way to learn the Qur'an is really by a teacher, is really by a teacher. So you can't assume that if you know the letters that you're going to get the keys and move on and learn it yourself. It's more um, audio. You have to hear it to learn how to read it or else you're going to be making a lot of those silly mistakes, silly mistakes in, in reading the Quran. And that's why, for example, even when we're talking about English language, you don't read the word love as la vie or uh, you read it as love, but you, you read dove even though you've got the uh, the, the O and the E, which are the two vowels, pretty much in the same order as the word love, but you read it in, in a different way. And the reason to that is we could say that language is more of a transmission that happened from one age or century or another generation to another until it got to us. Now, same thing with the Quran. Um, it's it, the, the, the way that it was preserved is in the sound of it and is in, in every single lengthening of it. So you can't assume that just by knowing the letters that that's enough. You have to have a teacher, which is why the ijaza is extremely important. It's in order to have make, to have that teacher overlook your recitation to make sure that you're actually reading it the way that it was recited and not the way that you see the words are written. And that's why when we look at, for example, certain letters that are uh, that are blended it, and, and the certain sounds that are connected or certain words or letters that are silent and, and so forth, you could see that those are part of the lessons that we get from that oral transmission that the Quran was in. And speaking about that oral transmission, that's the same exact reason, you know, what you, you would get a lot of Orientalists that would say, well, we, we found a manuscript that is um, that actually shows that the Quran has, you know, has been changed, etc. Not recognizing that indeed you will find some, you can find some um, manuscripts, probably Quran manuscripts that were probably written by students, or even we recognize that uh, typos um, are some things that may happen in written transmissions but but when we're talking about oral transmissions that's why with the oral transmission we've got jam on an jam on an jam so we've got that tawatur we've got this this group that is uh, reading the Quran to another group, to a third group, to a fourth group, and that's what makes those uh, those um, recitations so holy. In where it's not one that recognized that transmission, but it is actually a large group to the point that it becomes millions that will read the Quran in a certain way. So it's not enough to say, "Well, I've got." I've got um, a certain writing and here's the writing to prove you wrong or et cetera. So that oral transmission is key in Islam in preserving the Quran. So we've got that alif, lam, mim, sad. And um, I forgot to mention last time that the letters that come in that disconnected form, um, those the letters that she was. Sorry, that was a little thing off. 
uh, 14 letters and the 14 letters that come in that disconnected form are actually gathered and joined in one um, in one word or actually silhu suhayran man qata'ak so if you were to be told hey you've got a million dollars and i want you to guess what those letters are instead of remember that remembering them and trying to remember them scrambled all you need to remember is silhu suhayran man qata'ak the sad the lam the ha the sin the ha the ha, the ya, the ra, mim, noon, qaf, ta, ayn, and kaf. Those are going to be all the letters that come in that scrambled form from all the Quran. So instead of remembering kaf, ha, ya, ayn, sad, and trying to figure out, oh, did I mention the sad before? It's out of, that's an easy way to remember it. Okay, so kitabun unzila ilayka falayakum fi sadrika harajum minhu litundira bihi wa dhikra lil mu'min. We mentioned before. Kitabun unzila ilayk, and we talked about that in extensively. When we're talking about the kitabun unzila ilayk, we're looking at the words, we're looking at the letters, um, the, the letters that this Quran is formed from, which are really the Arabic letters. So kitabun unzila ilayk, this is talking about that the Quran that is that is recited onto you, um, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and also being transmitted to those that that are hearing the Quran, they actually come from these very main, very same letters that you read and you speak with that is during their time. And of course, kitabun unzila ilayk fa'ilayakum fi sadrika harajum min. And of course, it was talking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was a there was that moment in where um, we're not going to go in details with that. There was a, a moment where the Prophet ﷺ was feeling that people were rejecting the words and he was feeling that sorrow and the sadness. And this is really important to talk about because a lot of times people can give the da'wah, but it, you know the rejection can be taken sometimes personally. So don't take the rejection personally. At the end of the day is that your duty is to deliver the message and not necessarily gain um, gain the number of people to accept the message. Um, although, yes, indeed, it is it is a blessing to gain acceptance, and it is actually part of you knowing that you know the message is actually getting acceptance. The message is bringing in more and more hidayah. But at the end of the day, is that your duty is the main duty that you have to do as um, as a prophet or as a da'iyah or as a teacher is really just to deliver that message and the rest is really their responsibility to accept or to reject and that's what they're going to be held accountable for um so the main message was one it's in order to do that in nadir to be a warning and dhikra lil mu'minin dhikra as a reminder and we talked about last time why it didn't say bushra lil mu'minin and the main reason litunzira bihi is really to bring about that warning for those that reject the words and dhikra and even for the mu'minin for those that believe in the in the in the message that they would be reminded re, be reminded and we talked about the issue of reminded and we mentioned a number of different things we mentioned that there were two different opinions between scholars on whether reminded Reminded to mean um, reminded with what Allah subhanahu wa taala had um, had sent with Prophet uh, with um, or what Allah subhanahu wa taala had told us in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa taala with أخذ ربكم بني آدم من ظهورهم is this part of the memory when Allah subhanahu wa taala says that Allah subhanahu wa taala took from the children from the backs of from the back of Adam his own children and then made them witnesses on on themselves ألست بربكم am I not your Lord Almighty and they said verily you are and then we moved and we said that when we're talking about dhikra that it's a memory and we mentioned that memory the human memory is not only in, in the knowledge and what keeps track of our information about ourselves we talked about it's not just what you remember in your mind of something that had happened in the past or what you had learned from the time that you 
uh, began to understand or at least remember the different things around you, but it is actually the information that was also uh, put into you within al fitra So it's the information that was given to you, that was put in your fitra that you may not have recognized. So dhikra lil mu'mineen, where the Prophet ﷺ actually says, Kullu mawludan yuladu ala al-fitra. Every single, um, every single newborn, every single born, uh, every single born person, of course, um, they are born with an in innate instinct. There's that instinct. There's a certain feeling. There's a certain information that is on the inside that is not necessarily the information that you would have in your memory per se, but it is more of an information that is inside of you, just as the information or just as the instinct that you would get to do different things um, around you the information of fear, the information of, um, of uh, different feelings, all those different things on the inside, they act as the information. And based on that, you would react in your life. And part of those feelings is the instinct. Who created me? What am I created for? What is the essence of life? What is the purpose of life? Where am I heading? What is after what is after death? And we remember we remember from that when Qasab Nusayad al Iyadi, which are always in um in, enjoy just remembering um what he was actually telling his people. And Qasab Nusayad al Iyadi was a person that was before the prophetic era. Um Qasab Nusayad al Iyadi being before the prophetic era, but still. You know, the, this community and the surrounding around him was was mainly, of course, um, pagan. They were idolaters. They were worshiping the idols. But what happened was, is that the the birth, the the let me not not the birth, but um, the religion of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, which is Tawheed, with time and with a lot of different innovations has been totally forgotten. That message being forgotten only keeps about four people to recognize and have some history and traces of, of the religion of Prophet Ibrahim, but they couldn't really figure it out in to really make the whole sense of how to really worship and how to really understand um, how to really understand our existence and the essence of life. And part of those, and they're actually known every single name and every single person. There, there are only four, but they were known. And one of them, the Prophet Sallallahu had actually said that he will that he will be resurrected on judgment day to be a nation by himself. Um, to be a nation, uh, which is uh, uh, Amr, uh, Zaid ibn Amr, uh, Zaid ibn Amr, and he was, happens to be one of the cousins of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And um, he actually did his research in order to find the truth. Um, he went to the Jews and the Christians in in Syria, but they, you know, to make the story short, they just told him that in order to be within that institution, that religious institution, that they had to they they he had to accept some form of an innovation or a reinterpretation or editing the words in how they're understood. But um, he rejected that and said that, well, that's exactly what I refuse. And that's why I left paganism because that innovation was still there and people were in innovating and innovation after innovation, it becomes a totally new religion. But then while he was on his way back to Mecca after the long search of finding truth, that's when he gets killed in the middle of the way. And the, the Prophet said him actually said, you know, even though he did he really find truth, he didn't really find truth. Did he really um be, get to the religion of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam? He didn't really get it. Um, did he do much of a practice? Well, he was taking the girls, he was adopting the girls that were um that that were deemed or let's say that their parents were planning to um, to uh, you know, commit infanticide and kill them or bury them uh, as children, and he was adopting them and he was taking care of them. So he was doing certain things, and in fact, the Prophet ﷺ only met him once, really. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, and he was, you know, he asked him why he wasn't eating the the meat that was slaughtered for the idols, and that was the only time 
um, based on the hadith that was actually mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. But you could see that he didn't really get to the truth, but just taking those steps to figure out the truth, to really want to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the traces were were quite, um, were quite gone. Uh, he couldn't find anything. But in the end is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Sallam actually said that um, that he would be raised as and resurrected as, as a nation by himself. And um, his own his own son, Zaid ibn Sa'id ibn Amr ibn Nufail, okay, uh, he uh, he actually happens to be one of the ten that were promised Jannah. So you could see that his own child remembered what his uh, his father um was was struggling for and and that, and he ends up being one of those that believed in the Prophet and um, and even the part of the ten that were promised Jannah. Now, which is Zaid ibn Said ibn Amr ibn Nufail is is the, the details of the name. Now, when it comes to the other person that I was talking about, um, which is Qis ibn Sa'id al Iyadi, Qis ibn Sa'id al Iyadi has a, had a different story in where Qis ibn Sa'id he was searching for truth, but really didn't didn't understand how to find it but he was doing all those different orations to remind people of the main reason that there is a reason for the creation and that there can't be just a reason an, an, or you know the reason to be we're just alive and we die and that's basically it which is matter in motion really in our modern time in our modern time um, phrase um, that that the atheist and new atheism would use. It's that people were created in it. Well, not created, but they just happen to be, and it's just an ev evolution that took place, and they're just matter in motion. So you could see Qisab ibn Sa'ad al iyadi didn't just accept that as as a as a reason for life, or to accept it as uh, as the way that people were taking it. And that's why he was saying, um, and he was telling his people, oh people, listen and comprehend what I say. Those that have, that have, man um, those that have been created will soon be deemed to death. And whoever had died have long gone. And at the end of the day, every single one will be coming back. It's not that they have been doomed to, to nothing, to nihilism. Where did he get that from? Well, he got it from the pattern that he saw in, in nature that surrounds him. And he says, Laylun dej, when a harun sej. He looked at the pattern in nature and he says, you could see the dark night then brings the bright daylight. And we could see the how the skies and the patterns of the stars that surround us and that are up above us, that there's a pattern that we start and we end. And there's throughout the year, there's a certain pattern that we come back to throughout the year and in months and et cetera. And then there's a certain pattern. This pattern is telling us that there's a pattern in life. And he says, you know, looking at it, looking at the, the parts and the different patterns in nature. You could see how those waves in the oceans, they wave and the patterns and the, the currents in the ocean, they would come and and the currents, they bring other currents and there's a certain pattern for the currents. There's a certain pattern that we could see up and, up and below us. In other words, up above us and underneath us. And all those currents are telling us one thing. There's a pattern. It starts one, but then it continues and then it continues again. Looking at the patterns again, those high mountains and yet low earth for people to walk on. There's a low and a high. There's a current and there's a wave that passes, another wave that comes. 
There's the night and that there's the bright, or the bright daylight. All that comes in a certain pattern. And then he says, Ya ma'ashara iyad, ayna al-abaa wal ajdad? Calls on to his tribe and says, O people of iyad, that's his tribe, ayna al-abaa wal ajdad? Where are the our fathers and our great-grandfathers? What happened to them? Ayna al-abaa wal ajdad? Ayna al-fara'ina tashidad? And where did the pharaohs, the mighty pharaohs, that had a strong civilization go? Did they were they just put to sleep and they never came back and decided that where they had been put to sleep into happens to be a better life and a better provision with a better provision than the life that we are living in? And they decided to stay and not come back. Where did they go? Why didn't they come back? And taking that moment to think about it. And then he says, He says, in, in the early generations that had passed, we could see that there is a sign there's a wisdom to learn, and there's a lesson to look into and ponder into. When we could see that death is swallowing the old and the young from areas that we don't know of. It's just swallowing the people, the young and the old, and from a place that we don't really know where from. Where is death? coming from? Who's bringing it to us? In other words, who's bringing death and who's bringing life? The one that brought life is the one that brought death, but where to? Qas ibn Sa'ad al-Iyadi was also trying to get to, you could see with his fitra, with his instinct, trying to understand the essence, but there's really no way to get to the essence of life unless you actually get the other side, which is You can ponder deeply. You can think and think and overthink a lot of different patterns in the world around you. But are you going to really be able to get to the answer? So why are we created? All we could get to with our intellect, i.e. science, is that there's a certain pattern. All we could get to through science is how things function, but not necessarily where and why they're functioning towards that direction. We can understand probably a certain pattern, maybe our eyesight and how it's functioning and the reason why it's functioning that way. But in the end, in the end is that there are certain things that we can understand that it was to make this that the to make the ability to see but in the end is that does the idea of does the idea of sight precede the making of the eye or is it the opposite is it that the eye was made and then the eye decided let's use it for seeing but is that body a thinking tool to really understand and really put the reason for its, for the way that it made itself, what comes in first? And that's the same thing when it comes to the essence of life. When we take little small segments, whether it's the sight or whether it's the hearing or whether the, the body and how our body functions, all those different things. And then we put those in a whole different category called life then we have to ask the question, did the essence of life precede life or did, did we make the essence of life or do we make the essence to life, which is existentialism. And this is really important to talk about because what is happening during our, our time is the issue of existentialism and creating new ways of what they would consider as new new understanding of spirituality in where our spirituality lies within 
and regarded that God, we created God and not that God created us. We created the idea of God and considered that, therefore, all you need to do is just create your own essence to life and that there is no essence to life. And thought that that was a, a lot more tolerant or a lot more or a lot wider and a lot more under, uh, of a better understanding to life than a so-called narrow understanding of a religion where it is fixated upon or around belief around God. And here's the thing, is that the thing is, is that that idea with, with that postmodernism in where it actually considers that the center is really in, in the humans and that the center to understanding spirituality really lies in humans and it doesn't go farther than that. But in Islam, when we talk about spirituality, it goes farther than humans because it actually regards that that's not the start. It's actually living in absurdity to think that the start is humans because that's where it ends. And forgetting that whole dynamic that we live in, which is life. Where did it start from? How did it begin? Why did it begin? Where is it heading? All those different things in life, we cannot disconnect man from life and live that narrowness. Because the second you disconnect man from life and think that that is the point of start and that is the point of ending, then that is what is narrow. But in Islam, no. The point does not start from man, but the point precedes man. And it actually comes even before the existence of man. And before the existence of man, to mean before even life. In where it preceded man in place, it preceded man's existence in time, and it even preceded man's existence in, even in the purpose. And in Islam, when we look at that, when we look at that, that is going beyond the narrowness of that interpretation of postmodernism. This is really important to mention. It reminds me of, although not necessarily authentic, but it is mentioned in the books of Sira. When Rib'i ibn Amir was asked by, by um, Rustam, who was who was considered the 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 head of the army. I'm not sure what they're called right now. So they're the head of the army. He's like the, the lieutenant. I'm not sure what they're called in our modern day. But he happens to be the leader of the, the army for the, the, the king of Persia. And he was asked, so why and what drives you to the message or even the... the mm -hmm the path that you're taking to fight even Persia. And he says, God Almighty had sent us in order to free man from worshiping man to worshiping the Lord of man and to liberate people from the narrowness of this life to the vastness of the afterlife. And this is beautifully said. You know, it's it's it really amazes me when I look at our postmodern times and when you look at how the hadith and the ayat were even discussing those philosophies even before being prevalent during their times, but really the thought is the same. So here, ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum. Ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum. This is actually talking to both the disbelievers and also the believers that in order to, to get to that path, that 
that, that was created even before your existence, the essence to life, that there is only one direction that will get to you to the main purpose that you were created for, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent. It's not enough to recognize that there's a pattern, but there, it's really important to get to what began this purpose of life from the very start, which is in order to get to that purpose it was created for, follow ma unzila ilaykum, follow what was revealed unto you from your Lord Almighty. And we talked about the word Lord Almighty, meaning that the message that was sent was really coming from a merciful Lord. So just when you think that, oh, the religion is just making myself harder, that is actually to make your life easier. It's trying to put in those different areas to help you get to the direction to the direction that you need. Because whenever you would look at many that were lost, it was really because it was so vast and there's no worse place to get lost into than a place such as the ocean or the desert, where there's nowhere, no signs to tell you how to go back unless you have a starting point. If you don't have a starting point, if you don't have any, any traffic signs to tell you how and where to go back or to find, to find, um, to find any, um, any place for survival, you're just gonna get lost out and you're just going to go into circles in your life. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِتَّبِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ The word رَبِّكُمْ is to remind you that the message was really for one. The disbelievers was really because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was merciful and did not want to punish them. And for the believers, the, the message was really in order to help them find the destination to help them find the happiness, which is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in numerous ayat, that those that are the awliya, those that follow the path of their Lord Almighty, they will not find the fear and they will not find the sorrow. Why? Because that is how the Lord Almighty protects you from the wrong decisions that your own drives might actually drive you towards a different direction. Your own drives, we've got a, an animal nature part of us in where our own drives might lead us to our own hatf, to our own death. Our own drives may play games on us and manipulate us thinking that this is good for us. I'm finding pleasure in it, but in reality, it's actually taking us to our own death. We could feel and see, for example, maybe the pleasure of probably eating sugar or eating. And if we don't get that signal to stop or we don't recognize the, the amount and the, the, the amount and the portion that we should be eating, we could continue eating. And that's why when you look at animals, all they do is eat and eat and eat. They don't recognize that it's enough to stop, at least some animals. But when it comes to humans, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that is really to help you. For, it's a message for your merciful Lord Almighty in order to help you find the right path. And don't follow outside. Now, here's a Here's the word dunihi, and even though we mentioned it before, but I think it's really important because there's so many different paths that will try to lead you to go in a certain direction. There are so many different, so many different philosophies out there, although they would like to present themselves, although they would like to present themselves, um, it's probably a teacher, um, although they would like to present themselves as 
bringing in savior. And, and it's really important to mention here that when we're talking about philosophies, whether we're talking about economical philosophies or whether we're talking about moral philosophies or whether we're talking about, you know, the different philosophies out there, the philosophy doesn't just come, doesn't just come without wanting that with the people that made that philosophy not wanting that philosophy to prevail. So whether you're talking about um, Foucault or whether you're talking about um, whether you're talking about um, uh, Marx and and you're talking about um, uh, or the the different philosophers and that that you know out there that brought whether it's the Unitarianism, or whether it was the liberalism, or whether it's postmodernism, feminism, etc., all those are actually pushing at some thought that they think is the truth and are working hard in order to spread it around in order to make it the law that people are practicing, to make it the lifestyle that people live based on. And that's Wali. That's another Wali. And if you look at, for example, you take Simone de Beauvoir, you take Judith Butler, you take um, the, the feminists, and you take uh, you take um, uh, you know David Hume, you take John Locke, each and every single philosophy, you, Marx, and you take um, uh, John Paul Sartre, you take every single philosopher. They were doing their utmost in order to let that philosophy in it wasn't just a philosophy or an idea that they just wanted people to embrace but later you had governments that embraced those ideas and are indoctrinating or shoving it down people's throats even if it meant using military power take communism for example communism used military power oh well let's not just talk about communism isn't capitalism also doing the same thing and where you don't accept our order, you don't accept that we would take over your land, we will shove it down in where we will conquer, we will kill, we will use all our effort for you to accept that we have the right to take over your interests and that this, and when we're looking at what is called democracy and et cetera, and people are convinced that, oh, it's just giving people their rights when in reality, or hearing people's um, opinions or giving people the chance to have their voice heard, we could see it's not really that. It's actually a group of people that, a group of lobbies that are writing on the so-called democracy in order to, to um, indoctrinate the masses to taking their opinion. And you could see in in the powers, whether that's the LGBT movement, it's the atheist movement, in where they're pretty much right now the controlling the controlling lobbies that are shoving it in schools, indoctrinating in schools, indoctrinating. I know one time I had somebody say, you know, don't use the word indoctrinating because it almost it it makes it seem like you are uh, you are a fan of the 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 conspiracy theory and etc. <laughs> You see that that's it's not an issue of conspiracy. This is this is not a conspiracy. This is out in the open. This is not a conspiracy. It's out in the open where you could see that there's a there's a government that uh, that um, voted that made a certain law. There's a government that was that passed on certain laws that passed on certain ideas to be taught in schools, certain insurances and what they cover and all those different things. This is not a conspiracy anymore. This is this is something that is happening at a universal scale. You look at feminism and right now with feminism and where where it is the the UN itself that is posing those laws on world governments on inter as an international law that if you don't accept CDAO, you don't accept that idea, you have gone outside the universal law. It is becoming a universal international law where you don't accept it, you don't embrace it, we will run after you. We will consider you as not deserving the, the respect 
or the human respect, and therefore you are an outlaw from the international law, and you have run a different anti-human universal law that we regarded as what makes humanity and what makes and what defines human rights and what defines family rights and what defines the purpose. Now, they don't necessarily say purpose, but in the end is that it's leading to a certain purpose, which is that people and life is nothing but matter in motion. And therefore, people, they would live the life that they would want to live and the life that they would want to live. Who would want to push somebody not to live the life that they would want to live? Well, here's the thing, although it is presented that way, but the reality of it is that it actually considers it's a it's a conceived it's a, it's a uh, it's an idea that, you know, it's, it's an idea that precedes the whole the, the whole um, the, the whole legalization of different things and where since man is just matter in motion. So let man and let us preserve the man the the right for man to live based on his drives the drives for sexuality the drives to to um different things and where it is not the family that protects the children but it is the government that protects the children and now we could separate the family and it becomes this 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 little these little segments of mankind each going into a different direction. Imagine the life that it's heading. And that's why when we look at the ayah, awliya in our modern day includes the different philosophies that are out there, the different ideas, the different gods that people may be worshiping. Although worship, nobody says they worship Sigmund Freud. Nobody says they worship John Locke. Nobody says they worship David Hume's philosophy. Nobody says they worship um, uh, John Paul Sartre. Nobody says they worship or you know any of those philosophers or Foucault. They, nobody says they, they worship those philosophers. Absolutely not. But here's the thing, is that once you consider that that is the life, and this is what determines right and wrong, then technically speaking you had taken you had taken them as the ones to determine your path and your purpose of life and that's why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins that ayah follow the word ittabi'u is really follow ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum wa la follow what was revealed on to you whether that meant in the the idea the creed the purpose and who created you or whether it meant in the details or whether that meant in the details of in the details of life and how you live it very few people will be recognizing that that um that point of starting point which is the starting point and there's the lord almighty very few people will begin with that starting point now this one we look at the ayah it is reminding us that there's so many different nations so many different cities that were sent the message that had received the message yet kam min qaryatan ahlaknaha in other words how many cities think of the number of cities this is not here a question this is not a question but it is it, it is more of a a reminder you know it's more telling you like there's so many different cities so many different cities that were that were demolished why because when they rejected the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why demolish those cities? And it's really important to look at the word qarya. Like the city was de demolished. Is it the city or the people in the city? And why demolish them? Why 
go that direction. Once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the justice on ground and people reject the justice and people reject and go against Allah Almighty, then these people have waged a war on the Lord Almighty. And it's always like this when you look at the, there's always the politics and the military and there's jundun min junudillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send the information but when people go against the Lord Almighty, that is when the Lord Almighty, and look at that awliya, you, do, you take another wali, you take another, another authority over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually, will actually be the one to Take that revenge for rejecting and waging a war on the Lord Almighty. And then, How many cities were destroyed? The word and the letter fa, in where it didn't take long. And when you look at where the, the bas, which is the power which is the extreme power of the Lord Almighty actually had come to them bayatan during the night or awhum qailun or during the time that they were taking as a napping or a resting time it's really important to recognize a number of things here number one in where it said wa kam min qaryatin it's not necessarily talking about the city was destroyed and the people were saved but this is actually talking about that the city, the dis destroying the people that lived in the city went far beyond because of the Lord Almighty's power. It went far beyond the people to the point that it included the city itself. Even the city was destroyed, not only the people that were dwelling there. And that's very similar in Surah Yusuf. In where it says, and ask the city that we were in. It's kind of like saying, you know, everything in the city will speak what we what we had what we had um, wanted you to witness or what the witness, and that's the same thing. In the where welcome min qarya, it's like you know, the number of cities, it wasn't just the people, but it was even the city, the, the city itself speaks as evidence. The, the city itself speaks for you to actually see as an evidence that the Lord Almighty, when people reject his words, that they will be not only destroying themselves, but they will be deeming and there making that destroy that or making that punishment actually coming to them. They are the ones that had sentenced themselves to that punishment. And this is very often where we don't realize that we could be punished as individuals and we could be punished as a whole city or a whole nation. And man is absolutely weak. When did the punishment come in? During the night or during their stay? during their stay of napping stay at during their homes which is really similar to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually says in surah as-saffat fa idha nazala bisahatihim fa sa'a sabah al-munzarin when the punishment of the lord almighty comes in fa sa'a sabah al-munzarin that's it it's definitely fa sa'a it is going to be the worst morning that those that were warned had ever lived. And that's very similar to a number of ayat in where the different the different uh, punishments where Shu'aib and Prophet Shu'aib's um, nation was actually was actually destructed during the time of during that time of Qailula, during the time of the napping time, which is pretty much before noon. So around well yeah around noonish time 
um, while they're resting. And you could see that for um, for Prophet Lut alayhi salam, it was sent down at a, at, a, at a morning time. And then you could see those different times where they think that they're in the moment of resting, but in reality, what is coming to them is nothing but a destruction that will take over not only the people there, but even the city because of the massive destruction. Why the massive destruction happening? Once you do a massive war and a massive community is rejecting the Lord Almighty's, the Lord Almighty's words, that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send in something that will remind them of the Lord Almighty's power, which is very similar to how we have COVID today. People had lived and have forgotten. They really lived in all those provisions, all those blessings that they were living in, and had really forgotten a moment to just recognize that this world was not created for entertainment. And now people are suffering financially with health. Many are dying. Many are right now trying to find a, find a way out. Many are getting into homelessness, uh, being homeless and all that. And now we're seeing that the whole world, the construction of everything, economical construction, political construction, everything, every single construction is right now rethinking, rethinking its direction. Where should we go? فَمَا كَانَ دَعْوَاهُمْ إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا إِلَّا أَنْ قَالُوا إِنَّا كُنَّا ظَالِمِينَ فَمَا كَانَ دَعْوَاهُمْ Now we look at that ayah. فَمَا كَانَ دَعْوَاهُمْ What was the response? How did the people react when that punishment came to them? Now the word دَعْوَاهُمْ can be two different interpretations. فَمَا كَانَ دَعْوَاهُمْ It can be interpreted as their justification. How did they present their justifications? What was the claim that they had presented? Why they had rejected the word of Allah? Or it can be, فَمَا كَانَ دَعْوَاهُمْ To mean that the dua that they had done, the invocation that they were doing when that blast came in, when that punishment came in, which is really similar to what in Surat Ayah, in, in Surat, sorry, in Surat Yunus, in the Ayah, وَآخِرُ دَعْوَاهُمْ أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The last dua that they would be doing, that is the believers, that الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ All right? And you could see, فَمَا كَانَ دَعْوَاهُمْ is Actually taking two meanings. Now the first meaning that the claim that they had presented, in other words, the, the claim, the justification that they thought was going to be good enough or to protect them from, uh, from that, they thought it would be They just presented the claim. When the, the punishment came in, and they said, Inna kunna we were just doing the wrong thing. In other words, a form of trying to admit in a form of confession. We were really transgressors, but it is too late. The first thing that they were just admitting is that they were transgressors, but it was too late because already the halak and the punishment just came in. But the other interpretation, that the dua that they were making was really starting with one very main word. We were just, we were transgressors. And in other words, that was the beginning, admitting their mistake. And in other words, thinking that that dua, that invocation, that invocation would be enough to bring about survive, survival for, for them or to them. But then they discover that that is not going to save them after rejecting all the different signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent them to bring them back to haq. And that's why when we look at the different evil things that might happen to us, maybe an illness, maybe lose a job, 
maybe the death of a child, maybe the different harms that surround us are really sometimes sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to remind us of our weakness, to remind us of our weakness and to remind us to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that our weakness is actually still there. We just happen to make our weakness seem, for, seem like it is not there by forgetting about the weakness and the reality of our humanhood. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically reminding us to always do the dua even at the times of rakha, even during the times when everything is there for you. Make the dua during your health in order to have the dua answered when you lose your health. Give sadaqah and make the dua even when you have the money because your money is not going to stay forever. Make the dua for your children and when your children are alive, even when they are around you because your children will not always be there. Same thing. It's always taking that moment to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fil rakha during the moment of the blessings surrounding you. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remember you when there is a shidda, when there is hardship, during the predicaments that you might live. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forget? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forget. But the word nasiyah, we mentioned that before. Nasullaha fanasiyahum doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually forgot them or had forgotten them, but it actually means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had neglected them. And that's the same thing. In order for you to get your answer, your dua answered during those times of loss, during those times of weaknesses, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you are strong, during the times of your strengths. And that's how you can keep your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what were their claim? Well, their claim, they said, you know, we're here. We're going to admit that we we were transgressors. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, even though they came in and they said, you know, here's our justification. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we're going to ask, we're going to ask We're going to ask the messengers that were sent the message. Did they deliver it? Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that he had delivered the message and that the prophets had delivered the message. But in the end is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still ask right before them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask the two, will ask the messengers that they deliver the message, and will ask those that had sent that were sent the message. Did you deliver? Did you receive a message? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most just, and he will not punish any, any city or any country or any group of people if they did not get the message, which is exactly like Surah Al-Isra. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا We would not, we would not punish any city unless we would send a prophet to deliver the message and to remind them of the Lord Almighty. And that's the same thing. And here, we could see there are actually a number of ayat in where it is actually talking about the questioning. They're questioning. There's a there's a question. There's a there's an answer. There's a there's a dialogue that is ta- is taking place. That when the when the horn is blown into, then there's no progeny. There's no family relations anymore on Judgment Day. And they, there's no question. They don't even question it. And that's the same thing in the, another ayah. And when the ayah says that best friends 
حميم حميم. They wouldn't even care to ask about one another. They wouldn't even ask, be asked about their, their sins. So are those contradictory ayat? They won't be asked about their, their sins. So how do we understand that those ayat, some of them are saying that they will be questioning, there's no question, there is a question. Those are at different stages. There are certain stages that there's no question about it. They're just going to be drived to a certain, um, to a certain destination. And there are certain ayat that will that will reveal that there will be some questions, there will be some some um, some stations on Judgment Day where they will be asking one another or they will be accusing one another. So in other words, it depends on the station. It's not that the ayat are contradictory. It depends on the station that this is actually this is actually speaking of. And that's why well, um, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Another station. Now here, in another station, they would say, you know, if only we we were able to hear and we were able to understand and comprehend, we wouldn't have been part of the people that dwelled in hellfire. And they had then confessed in the uh, they would confess bear with their bear with their sins. They had confessed their sins, and this it's like the curse for all those. They, they, they were cursed now for those after even confessing, and that's the same thing. And where certain times it wasn't only not discussing things or asking questions, but there are certain stations in the Akhira where even the questioning and the dialogue would not only be to people, but would only it would even be to their own body parts. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fussilat, وَقَالُوا لُجِلُودِهِمْ لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا قَالُوا أَنْتَقَنَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي أَنْتَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ الَّذِي أَنْتَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ What happened? They said to their skins, why did, were you why are you witnessing against us? So they said, Our Lord Almighty was the one that made us speak. He is the one that makes and has the ability to make everything speak. In another ay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will will resurrect and will bring and combine all the prophets and will tell them, What did you answer? Did you do what I told you to do? And that is when they will respond that we delivered the message, but they rejected. We tried our best, but they rejected. Oh, we pre we passed our time. In other words, with all those questions, with all those dialogues that will take place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say the details. Now the word naqus, the qus is like to cut, but this is not to cut, but this is actually saying that they will be told in every single detail, intricate details, just like when you cut something, you take it little by little by little. And that's the way the story will take place. It will start and you will know every detail of your story and every detail of what you had done. And it will be brought to you with ilm. It will be brought to you with complete knowledge that you will not whatsoever deny. You will be able to recognize in the picture of it, in the image, if we could, in our own life as human beings, we're able to see cameras recording, we're able to see voices being recorded, we're able to see all those different, all those different technological methods for recording. Is it going to be hard on the Lord Almighty to record in the in pictures and sounds and every detail of it? Definitely not. 
It's going to be behind. It's going to be recorded in every single corner. And what a shameful recording it would be if it was going in the wrong corner. And what a great recording it would be if it was actually recording something that you were doing in your seclusion or out in the public. And your Lord Almighty. We could see that the word kunna is here in plural, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his all seeing, in his all knowledge, in his power, in all the different names and the tributes of the Lord Almighty. That's why it used kunna, meaning in all the names and attributes of the Lord Almighty, he was never absent, never absent from what you were doing, not in any second of it. The Lord Almighty was there. On that day, الوزن, on that day, الوزن, the scale, the weighing of things. On that day, it's going to be in complete justice, where it will not miss, not even an iota, not even any, any small detail, any action, it will not miss it. So why wal wasnu yawma idhan al haq Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent il mizan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent il mizan and told you, ittabiru, there was that mizan, there was that scale in order to tell you to follow the justice. But when people fail to follow the justice that the Lord Almighty had sent on ground, now there is nowhere that you can run. You could probably had the free will to follow the justice or to reject it at one point. But now, now the Lord Almighty is the only one. You have no, no free will now, but now the Lord Almighty is the one. Once the justice in life, once the justice was not practiced in this world, in dunya, now justice is for sure to be practiced in the akhirah. And that's where many times I would get I would get people coming to my office that would say, well, I was, I was, I was treated in such and such way. In other words, oppressed in such and such way. I was abused in, in many different things in my life. And a lot of those that abused me are now dead. Is there any way for me to seek justice? I said, if they're dead, you can't really do much about it. But that's why for the mu'min, they would know that that is not the end of their oppression. That is not the end of their justice. And that's why for a believer, they don't succumb that I was abused and this is the end and there's going to be the trauma that will always be there on my back, making me suffer every single day of my life. But for a believer, they know what was no yawma idhin al haq They know that their rights, that justice will one day take place by the Lord Almighty. فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And those ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُ Those that had their scale way more in their good deeds than the wrong deeds فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Then those are the people that will be مُفْلِحُونَ That will be the ones to succeed. Now scholars had different opinions on whether فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُ On whether it's the, the human himself will be weighed or whether whether it's the deeds that will be weighed and how the weight is. And is it one scale or many scales? But at the end of the day is that the Lord Almighty, the Lord Almighty 
had had told us, you know, it's it's not it's not an issue. And in, in the end, is that the scale is going to weigh that the actions that you do. The scale is going to depend on and what determines the heavy weight is not how much um, how much fat you have consumed. It's going to depend on how much you have done. The amount that you have done in action, in good, that is going to determine whether you are put on the scale or whether it is your deeds that are put in the scale. In the end, it's going to be really the same thing because what is going to determine a heavier scale and a heavier weight is really your actions in this dunya. And that's going to determine everything. Regardless of whether it's the person or whether it is the deeds or whether it is the book that contained your deeds. In the end, it's really leading to the same exact thing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those muflihin and make us from um, make us from those that will be part of those that will be on judgment day um, getting a heavy scale with their good deeds Amin ya Rabbi. I would be happy to answer any questions or if anybody would like to correct me on something that I might have said wrong um, I'd be happy to I'm going to here allow you to unmute yourself sorry I uh, I took out the ability for you to uh, to mute yourselves because there was some some distraction in the middle. Um, so if anybody has any question that they would like to write, or they would like Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or they would like to write, or whether they would um, like to go on the mic and 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 actually say it directly, I'd be happy to hear it. Even even the the people on Facebook, Mashallah, there were a number of people that joined us on Facebook. Um, I'd be happy to um, listen. So if anybody has any questions. All right, so that takes us to the end, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. So the, the, the thing somebody's asking for, Qis ibn Sa'ad al-Iyah, these words, I would have to look it up, really. I, I said it out of my memory. And that's why I kept pausing. Um, so it's Qusub Musa'ad al I'd be happy to send it right now. I just um, Googled it really quick and I'll send it right now and hopefully I can um, hopefully I can I can send it to you. Um, I memorized that as a young girl and it is it is one of my favorite it it always just it, it it always just you know it's 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 just a it's it's a beautiful thing you know please have your children memorize it it's it's a beautiful thing to memorize and, and have your children memorize it maybe take a moment to think of it um I, i'm gonna send it here i'm gonna send it here because i definitely will lose your number um, and I just sent it right there. And you can memorize it. Take a moment to, you know, go and get to send it right there. Um, so we'll see you all next week, inshallah. And um, Jazakumullah Khairan for, you know, being there um, and being patient to hear my words. I know sometimes it's hard to be patient and actually listen. Like I always say, so many times I'm like, and these people, ya haram, they have the patience to listen to my words, ya haram. <laughs> um, yeah, we could definitely do. Somebody's asking to do a dars on khutbat al wada. Yeah, that would be beautiful. That would be beautiful. We will, inshallah. Inshallah, we will. All right, so for the people on Facebook, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. And and inshallah, I will, Sister Safa. That's actually a very good idea. Yeah, that's that's a very important one. I don't think I have done that. Uh, I don't think I have done a lecture on khutbat al wada, but it would be, it would be a uh, beautiful. Yeah, we will do it, inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah, we will present um, the the text for it as well. All right. Um, so, how do we get the English translation for the the text that I had sent you for Qasab Nusayad al Iyadi? 
you know, I don't know if it was translated. You could just listen to the listen to the lecture and just take my translation, I guess. All right, assalamu alaikum everyone and jazakumullah khairan for attending.